And hi, everybody, and welcome to this special Q&A from here at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm Dan Loney, the host of Wharton Business Daily on Sirius XM 132, daily show from 10 a.m. to noon Eastern time, 7 a.m., starting out on the West Coast. Our guest today as part of this Q&A is the Chief Economic Advisor for Allianz, and he's now a Senior Global Fellow at the Joseph H. Lauder Institute for Management and International Studies, as well as a Professor of Practice here at the Wharton School, Mohammed El Aryan. Great to see you. Thank you for coming in and doing this. Thank you for having me. So I mentioned you're now doing work here at the University of Pennsylvania in the Wharton School, and obviously you're interacting with a lot of students over the course of your time here. What is it that you are hearing from them? What are the types of questions that are on the minds of students these days? So they really want to know what sort of career are they going to have? What sort of world are they going to graduate in? And they are curious about how unpredictable our world has become. So there's a lot of interest in what skill set do I need um, to navigate this world. But like, like most people of their age, they're worried. They're worried about the environment. They're worried about debt. They're worried about jobs, income. Um, and they're worried about inequality. So, so there is an element of concern mixed with an element of, of excitement. You know, they're dying to get into the real world. How do you view the state of the global economy right now? Fragile, I think, is, is what, the word I would use. Uh, for the last few years, and in particular since the global financial crisis, we have been on a painkiller. Um, and that painkiller has been incredible liquidity support by central banks. And they've kept the economy going. Um, they've certainly helped asset prices with stocks at all-time highs but they haven't solved what's holding back genuine, inclusive economic growth. They haven't done anything, and they cannot do anything to help with infrastructure, to help with labor retooling, labor retraining, education reform, all the key things that drive genuine growth. Um, they were supposed to build a bridge to a comprehensive policy response, mm -hmm. which requires the politicians, and so far it's been a bridge to nowhere especially in Europe. That is a real issue in Europe, much more than it is in the US. Well, then should a lot of people out there watching us today be concerned that we are going to see a, a quote unquote crash in the near future? The way I, I, I answer that question is, if I had sat with you four years ago and said, Dan, with a high degree of confidence, this is what's gonna happen in the next four years. Right. What would you have thought of me? I would have said, look, we're going to have $17 trillion of bonds. That's a lot of bonds trading at negative yields, which means people will be willing to lend their money and pay for the privilege of lending their money. There isn't a single textbook that says that's a possibility. If I told you the US, the champion of free trade, would become the most protectionist country in the world. If I told you that the UK would vote for Brexit, if I told you we'd get all these anti-establishment outcomes, if I told you Hong Kong would be on the verge of something that could be very, very significant. Um, all these were unthinkables, and yet they become reality. Our tendency, because we don't like taking, being taken out of our comfort zone, is to say they're isolated. They're not. The system is telling you it's under tremendous stress, that we, can con we cannot continue on this painkiller. We're starting to see the unintended consequences of being addictive to a painkiller that's not having much impact in terms of what really matters. So then what do you think is a, a bigger concern moving ahead into 2020 right now if we see a no-deal Brexit or if there is a hard landing by China's economy? So no-deal no Brexit is an issue for the UK and for Europe, but less so. For the rest of us, it's a curiosity, honestly, <laughs> okay? Because it is really, the, the impact is focused on the UK and on Europe. China is very different. China is the second largest economy in the world. Um, there are a lot of linkages that go through China, both on the supply side and, and on the demand side. So a Chinese hard landing would have global consequences well beyond what Brexit would have. So we talk a lot about, in the, in the recent period, about uh, the trade war between the United States and China. Uh, and now there's a lot of talk about a quote unquote phase one deal being completed. What's the likely impact of phase one on the U.S. and on 
the global markets. And obviously, we need to know what's involved in that as well. So think of phase one as a truce. That's what it is. It's a no war, no peace. Okay. Okay. So the good news is that it's no war. So we're not going to have an escalation of tariffs unless the whole thing falls apart. But the bad news is also not a peace. It's not a durable peace. And that's because it leaves out key issues where there are genuine grievances. Intellectual property theft is an issue. Forced transfers of technology is an issue. Um, forcing people through joint ventures, which is less of now, but th that also was an issue. So I, th I think there's a fundamental element of, if you're gonna have free trade, it also has to be fair. What this phase one does, it, it lowers the tension, it lowers the volume, but it doesn't fundamentally solve anything. So then do you think that there is enough in the works right now? Obviously we have to get through phase one, but then to start to tackle what could be phases two, three, and on down the road. So there's two issues that concern me about that. Um, that's my hope, yeah. but, but I think there's two issues. One is taking a really long time to get phase one out. True, yes. Right. So that yeah. tells you that, that, that it's very hard to negotiate when you're missing two things, trust and verification. And I think that those elements are problematic. The second, which is even a bigger issue, it's no longer than about economics. It's about economics and national security. Right. right. And the minute you bring in the second element of national security, you complicate the negotiations a lot. And you know, my own gut feeling is we're going to get a truce, but the more likely um, follow-up is renewed tension rather than a durable peace. I hope I'm wrong. But that's, you know, you want to hope for the peace, but you want to plan on an escalation of tension again. So as part of our Q&A here today, we have a variety of questions that we have received in from the Wharton social media accounts. And I want to dig into a couple of those right now, if we can. Uh, Anthony Morano, if the EU decision post-crisis would have been to remove Greece from the euro currency, how would you have structured and planned the Greek exit? So these counterfactuals are really difficult, okay? <laughs> um, it would have, first of all, it would have been messy. There's no doubt that the first couple of years at least would have seen a massive recession, would have seen lots of defaults, and would have seen probably social and political tensions. Um, so, it would have been hard, and I understand why every time where there was the new Greek government that had a referendum behind it and an election, okay, to, to, to exit if they didn't get what they wanted, they didn't get what they wanted, didn't do it, or whether it's European, the other Eurozone members who, who didn't um, say to Greece, I'm sorry, but you don't belong in the club. I understand why there was that hesitation. No one wanted to go down in history for being responsible for two years of an economic, institutional, financial, social, and political mess. Having said that, um, some of the fundamental issues haven't been addressed. And it's good news that Greece now is at least growing again, but it has lost 30% of its GDP. Yeah. Um, so one would have been a very sharp V, and this one has been more like a U, and the hope that they're going to continue on the U side. From uh, John Allen, is there a cyclicality to how partisan global politics have become, and can a moderate win? It's hard. If you look at any distribution, um, whether it's political, social, or institutional, the, the middle, the center has been hollowed out. And that is partly the result of too many years of economic growth that has been too low and insufficiently inclusive. So not enough in terms of people's aspiration, and that there's this strong perception and reality that the benefits of that growth have gone to the well-off. What happens when you get that? You get political anger. What happens when you get political anger? People are willing to dismantle things, even if you don't have a substitute. Brexit is an example. People were happy to, to vote for dismantling a long-term economic relationship without knowing what they want in, in its place. Sure, yeah. um, so it is very difficult to put the genie back in, into the bottle. So I think we're gonna go through a period, whether it is the political center, whether it is the middle class, whether it is mid-sized institution, where that center it's going to be very hard um, to populate. From Owen Luttrell, where do you see automation taking the economy and how will this affect jobs? So I think automation and, and more importantly, this 
incredible combination of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and mobility is going to take us to places that we cannot completely imagine. And society as a whole will be better off, but there will be big gainers and big losers. Um, so first of all, what's, what's great about that is whether it's, I always say to people, look at Amazon, Google, and Uber as an example, what they allow you to do. And what's exciting about these three innovations to an economist is that you improve both the supply and the demand side at the same time. So Uber is an example. You bring in more vehicles that already exist and simply are underused onto the marketplace. So you increase the supply at very low cost and you increase demand because people really like to be in control right. of outcomes. Right. Um, so you're gonna have all these changes that, 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 that will alter not just what we do, but how we do it. And that's really powerful. Having said that, we're learning two things. One is you enable bad actors as well as good actors. And we need to figure out a way to do that. And secondly, certain people will be marginalized for no, no um, they can't be blamed for that. And we, we've got to think very seriously about our safety nets. Our safety nets today are inadequate. A uh, question from Deval Malhotra. Uh, what are your views on telecom sector's impact on a country's economy? So I think go to Kenya to see how telecom can totally rev revolutionize um, finance, for example. So, so what is telecom? Basically, telecom is an ability to leapfrog. Um, micro, my, microfinancing, banking with your phone, suddenly you can leapfrog many stages of development right. through that. So it can have a huge element. But again, like any technology, you enable good and bad. And you have to be careful of, of minimizing the bad. But it is part of the leapfrogging that, that many developing countries can do right now. And that's really exciting. Playing off the banking part of this for a second, then what do you see as the, the role in the future of cryptocurrency? So I think they're going to always exist as part of the ecosystem. But I do not believe they're going to develop into a big, fully accepted currency. Um, and by fully accepted currency, it's something that serves three purposes. One, it's a medium of transaction that everybody accepts with, tr with, with full trust. Second, it, it fulfills a precautionary demand you can save. It's a store of value. And third, which it will do, it becomes a speculative element of, of, of that. The reason why is because central banks won't allow this to happen. Right. The issuance of currency um, involves huge benefits. And that's not something that, that they're going to give up easily. Plus, crypto in particular can enable a lot of bad actors on that. But, but at the same time, I, I, I'm not of the, of the view that this is an absurd concept. It's not. I think what's really exciting about cryptocurrencies is the underlying technology. I think blockchains, technology, that's going to spread both in the private and public sector. Another question from online from Paolo Dutra. It seems like backlash to globalization is intensifying out there. What responsibilities do governments and businesses have in helping the general public understand the benefits of free and cooperative trade? Yeah, and, and Paolo's absolutely right um, that there, we, we have pressed pause on the globalization process and we are this close to pressing the button for deglobalization. And if we press the button for deglobalization, there's going to be a massive adjustment process because the system is wide for globalization. So the system can handle a pause. It cannot handle going back in reverse easily. So there, there would be a lot of breakages. Um, it's important to understand, again, people fell in love with the benefits of globalization and didn't realize that it was an equation, benefits, costs, and risks. Right. So we all focus on the benefits. And the costs and risks weren't managed. And the costs and risks created a lot of anger in, in the system. Um, and that's the backlash. As I said earlier, I don't think it stops anytime soon. So governments have to spend a lot of time explaining that when you look at the equation as a whole, A, it's positive, the benefits are greater than the cost and risk, and B, they will take seriously the management of the, of the cost and risk. Secondly, so, um, corporates, which is the second part of, of Paolo's question, and I'm glad he included, have also responsibility. 
And I think they, they're starting to realize that having a social responsibility, being responsible towards the environment, being responsible towards a big range of stakeholders is not just a good thing to do, it's an absolute necessity. You cannot be a good house in a bad neighborhood. You have to worry about the neighborhood. And for too long, companies have assumed, if I just get my business right, the neighborhood will be fine. And now they're realizing, you know what, we need to take some responsibility for the neighborhood. So do you think that that, that mindset exists in general across the scope of the globe right now with, with not only corporations, but with the public in general? So I think that among corporations, it exists more than it did before. Right. It, does it exist in general? Not yet. Right. But you, I think we've gotten to a critical mass. But is it moving in the right direction? Yeah, and you see it with, with ESG, you see it with certain initiatives where, where businesses are started embracing their responsibility. So, so yes, it's moving. It started from a pretty low base. Um, but I think we've gotten to a critical mass where it's gonna build more traction. On the government side, no. Um, and you have to understand, on the government side, it's hard because if you, if you respond to the anger, you can get elected, right? And, it's true, yes. and, yeah. and therefore, because of political cycle being so short term, we're gonna go through this first, I'm gonna to respond to the anger, okay, until we get to a second stage where, okay, that's fine, but you can't replace something with nothing. That's what the UK is discovering. You cannot replace something with nothing. So you have to have a point of view as to what it is that you want to iterate to. And I think that's going to come to. Last question for you. Uh, obviously, you do a lot of work with economists, uh, business leaders, the media. But here at the Wharton, you're going to be an instructor here at the Lauder Institute. Why the decision to spend your time in the classroom? Because I really enjoy and learn from being surrounded by smart people. And what I find at Lord and Wharton is you get students that are very motivated. They come from incredibly diverse backgrounds um, in terms of culture, nationality, interest. Um, purpose is important for them. And they have absolutely no hesitation to speak out and let, and let you know what their view is. Um, so you get pretty quick feedback. Um, and I've engaged in conversation where literally um, the class starts talking among itself. And I step back and I learn a ton. Um, and then in the follow-up, I learn a ton. So, you know, the, 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 the hypothesis going into this was here's a group of very smart, um, inspired and enabled students that I can learn from. And the reality is I've learned a lot more than I thought I was going to learn. I mean, it's, it's been great. And it's been a lot of fun as well. You can see it on your face with the smile that you oh, have. Oh, I love it. I, lo I tell yeah. you, I, I, lo I love every single class. It's been a lot of fun. Pleasure having you here today. Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you. Mohammed al Aryan, And a pleasure to have all of you joining us here for our Q&A session here on, uh, at the Wharton School.